Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Thank you for coming out and braving the rain. My name is Courtney Gardner, and I'm the executive director here at the Peninsula Fine Arts Center. On behalf of the staff and the board of the PFAC, I want to welcome you to the 2014 Artistic Verses Readings and Reception. The value we believe of Artistic Verses for our students is immeasurable. <clears throat> Through this program each year, many students are given the opportunity to visit this art museum and to see some really incredible work. What's really um, kind of different for this year is that the um, exhibition series that the students use for inspiration is still on view here at the Art Center. It is Masterworks of American Impressionism. It is um, a really special exhibition for us. It represents a significant investment and we are always thrilled to have the opportunity to share it with the community. Um, so I really strongly encourage you to look around and to um, see what inspired the students. And I will tell you for the first, second, and third place winners, your poetry is exhibited right beside the work that inspired um, your work. So um, everyone will get to read your work today. So welcome, I guess. This is the first time you can technically consider yourself published, I suppose. Um, so congratulations. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce my partner in crime in this project, Kelly McCoy-Smith, who is the Instructional Specialist from Newport News Public Schools. Good morning and welcome. The first thing I'm going to say is it's really exciting on a day like today when it's so dreary to have a packed house of students, of parents, of teachers, of central office staff, of community members. So first and foremost, thank you very, very much. I've had the pleasure of doing this event for a number of years and it's always a joy at this time to be able to tour with the students and to attend the workshop with Nathan Richardson and to see them have such a great time and it's just reaffirming that our young people are doing amazing things that we don't hear enough about. So for the students, for the parents, for the teachers, the coordinators, everyone who's here, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Now I do have a list of thank yous so if you will bear with me. This is a seemingly easy event, so to speak, because it's been in progress for so long, but it continues to develop and we continue to have, like you see today, more cameras, more chairs, and more people. So there are some people that I do want to thank for making this event possible. First of all, I have to thank the students because of your interest with signing up to do this program and for your dedication to follow through with creating poems that were absolutely amazing. So I have to thank you all first and foremost. And for the coordinators at each high school, I would like to acknowledge you. Scott Krause from Heritage High School, Ashley Francis from Achievable Dream Middle High, Wendy West from Warwick High School, Tina Mayavich and Janine Carneal from Menchville High School, and Alex Adams from Woodside High School. So if we could give them a round of applause, that would be great. <laughs> and the PFAC is, is amazing, and all the calls and the emails and all of the scheduling we do. So I do have to thank, as Courtney so appropriately said, my partner in crime. I have to thank her for all that she does to prepare and Joan Dobson for the phone ringing off the hook for scheduling for RSVP. So thanks, thank you students and coordinators for doing that. Amber Kennedy who made our fantastic invitations and the docents who gave the students the information that they needed to have their poetry be successful and as enriching as possible. And we can't forget our muse, Mr. Nathan Richardson, for inspiring our students to create poetry that is just magical. So thank you for that. And last, and uh, but certainly not least, the Peninsula Community Foundation and the Newport News Arts Commission. You are a big reason why this project continues, so thank you for your support. And from Newport News, um, 
Ms. Susan Tilley, who is the Executive Director of School Leadership, and we thank her for being here today. Ms. Nancy Sweat, who could not be with us today, who is our Executive Director for Curriculum and Development. Dr. Kilgore, our Superintendent, for continuing to sponsor um, and back this project. And then the Newport News TV Channel 47 crew, who is here with us today, we thank you. Any school board members I can't see in the back? Okay, just wanted to check because I know that some were planning on coming. Uh, last but not least, I, I'm very fortunate to not only do this Artistic Versus project, but I work with some of the most amazing women ever. And I could not do anything that I do on a daily basis, let alone with this project, without thanking them. So to my team, Christina Gonzalez, Danielle Smith, Dee Fehrenbach, and Lynn Mills, thank you for everything that you do on a daily basis, and thank you for helping with this endeavor in ways that I could never say thank you enough for. And they are all in the back. So thank you to everyone. Now with the good stuff. This year when we sent out the invitation and the winners, uh, the coordinators were replying quickly, what place did, what place did they get? What place did they get? And we kind of did a little mystery this year and didn't tell the place that the students, uh, that the students got, but rather that they just placed. So at this time, what we're going to do is we are going to have the contest winners, the top, the first, second, third, and then the honorable mentions. We are going to give you an opportunity at this point to come and read your poem. So our first place winner this year is Miss Azaria Brown from Warwick High School with the 17th gust of wind. Azaria? Woo! There is nothing colder than the 16th gust of wind that blows through a big city in the middle of winter. A wind that makes smoke curl and dance, tendrils of mixed emotions. A wind that chills fingers and elbows and cheeks and makes mothers clutch their babies. A bundle of blankets and trembling flesh. There's nothing colder than the 16th gust of wind, except the 17th and the intransigent businesswoman. She walks that way every morning and conveniently stares at her phone long enough to avoid giving the homeless man a dollar. The man that is primary witness to all 17 gusts of wind. The man that never stops smiling, a true resident of the bright side. The man that sleeps on the sidewalk while she sleeps on the top floor and he's okay with this. Mm. Heat may rise, but so do egos. Cream may sit at the top, but so does palm scum. And when she's risen so much that the only things keeping her grounded are gravity, grief, and guilt, he hopes she'll throw a thought his way. And he'll watch it fly and tumble, getting lost in the 17th gust of wind. <laughs> See, now you know why I like this job so much. Amazing. Okay, thank you, Azaria. Our second place winner is Miss Gabby Biava from Minchville with Silverfish. <clears throat> I remember sitting on the edge of the long, narrow dock, staring down at the serene water below me, the smooth feel of the fishing rod in my hand. It was hot that day. I could feel the beads of sweat starting to form on my forehead. I watched the watermen hauling in their day's catch, making small talk as they went. The smell of fresh fish overwhelmed my nostrils. Tiny flecks of the peeling blue paint from the shack behind me clung to my jeans. The tug at the end of my line snatched me out of my daydream. I snapped the bright blue rod back, hooking the fish. Then, it was just a matter of time before I gave up the fight. I let the line slack and reeled, in and reeled it in again. I repeated this action over and over until the silver fish just skimmed the surface. I lifted it out of the water and smiled. I wrapped my fingers around its slimy, scaly body. The fish still put up a fight, writhing in my hand. 
I examined it for a minute and lowered my hand down into the water and watched as it swam away. It got lower and lower in the water and then disappeared. Off to its children, maybe. Who knows? But now it has a story to tell about the time it escaped the snares of death and lived to tell the tale. Thank you, Gabby. And finally, our third place is Passion on the Beach by O.G. McGlover of Achievable Dream High School. Okay, she's not here. She's on her way. Okay, she's on her way. Well, I think this happened last year, and I tried in vain to read her poem like she would have had it, and then she came back and read it with much more excitement and depth. So we are going to wait for her. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll move on to the honorable mentions, and the first honorable mention is Drop by Madison Brady from Warwick High School. Are you with us today? Okay. How about Silent Screams by Doresia Elliott of Heritage High School? Silence. It is the calmest inferno round, the quiet chirp of birds, and untouchable sounds, unworthy sounds, not wanted in dismay. And in this, calls for a solemn moment to pray. Ashes upon ashes, the hot flakes of burnt black tint the yellow touch pages. Like ink dripping from a broken pen, it leaves an uncanny blotch name mistakes or oops, the burn of sin. Each flare of the suffocating end and puff that pours out, stench drop smoke widens the empty gap felt inside. Fingers tremble as pages turn and I scan the words Searching for something to simply pop out and touch them. Fill the emptiness and leave in its place something that will bury the pain. Silence has become the devil's game and suddenly he's a pawn. Forced to play along and bite his tongue. He is bound by mummy old bandages, wrapped in red cloth and sandwiched in. This false piece grips his vision and all sight is blurred. No way to be heard. He silently screams out, torrents of broken words and half sentences. Gaze glazing over his father's holy words, but unable to comprehend. The Bible is fading in. Blank passages and unfinished parables, scriptures diving into their own core, being pulled by Satan's strings as the devil orchestrates a symphony of righteous gore. And then he breathes. Eyes now closed, yet the smoke remains. It dulls the pain, but the sting from the yellow touch pages is too much to bear. Ashes upon ashes. The hot flakes of burnt black tobacco smelt his father's words. Like ink dripping from a broken pen, it leaves an uncanny blotch name mistakes or oops, the burn of sin. Each hit from the incarnation of tainted temptation widens the gap until the Mariana's trench is felt inside his heart. He breathes, pinches away the flame at the front of the cigar, folds over the book, and tries again. Silence. It is the calmest inferno around. The muffled chirp of birds and non-tangible sounds. A plea from humans, these sounds, not wanted and in dismay. And in this, calls for a solemn moment to pray. <laughs> never used your poem that you've committed it to memory. So, wow, thank you very much. You're a hard act to follow. Okay. Now, if we could have, if she is here, um, Hush by Rachel Holiday from Woodside High School. Lines are drawn, the candles blown out, but only in this room. Everywhere else, the world kept turning, everyone kept on with their lives. 
Someone somewhere laughed and she cried. Someone somewhere cried and she cried harder. This room was a vacuum. There were no sounds, there was no love, no life. And she liked it that way. Because if there were no sounds, she wouldn't hear herself break. This wasn't an act of love. The words left a bitter taste in her mouth. His hands seared her, seared her skin. His lips whispered words that sunk like anchors. And when he was done, she would lay lifeless on the floor, hoping he wouldn't smell her fear. He'd leave her for dead, and she wanted to be. Safety was a relative term. There was none here. All right. <laughs> thing that we were able to have additional funds for honorable mentions because it would have been extremely impossible to choose from all this fantastic work. Okay, if Dominique Lewis from Warwick High School is here with Inspire. No regrets come this far from every step, from every right, from every wrong, from every book, from every song, from every love and last heartbreak, the things you give, the things you take. You close your eyes, you close your mind, you have it all because you're blind. <laughs> And to round off our honorable mentions, Renee Rounds from Menchville High School, Mr. Reed's beautiful fascination. Her hair, shining and soft, looking in the sun, captivates me, though it's in the bud. Her hands move gracefully as she glides them through the water, feeling the brisk coldness of the river. Her face need not be shown, for her looks do not matter to her or me. Her grace and the beauty in her movements, though need be. Her smile is beautiful, yes, but you would never be able to tell when she's in a dress. She secretly longs for freedom, which I offer here in my kingdom. She plays with the water of the river and laughs. Her shoulders shake, and I'm taken aback. Her movements are mesmerizing, and her voice is angelic, but you never know the way I paint. For it is her grace and not her beauty that I admire most. And perhaps I only painted this painting to boast. Okay, and if we could give them all another amazing... <laughs> I will need the certificates and what we will do is we will present you with the certificates and afterwards anyone else in the room who you all have your poetry we would invite you to come up to read and then the final reading will be done by Nathan <coughs> is $100. Oh, right. Okay, and Gabby Piava? Holiday, $35 as well. 
Michelle Cooper. to watch the scenery. She walks closely onto the rocks, water waiting upon her legs, her dress, reflecting and brooding at the meaning of her life. She does not know how much time she has left before her heart breaks into what was once a masterpiece into a teach fracture of a puzzle. Standing where love was lost and people died of a heartbreak, she struggles. Her soul on the brink of desolation. She had hope, she had love, but soon it turned into the ashes that have now become a gravestone. Her eyes wander down to the fishes under the sea and pack together to find a path of serenity. Her mind is calm, her heart is at ease, or so she thought when no one else believes. She climbs down and walks slowly under the water, possibly dying slowly, but not painfully. She has made her choice and hopes to save another. She is gone, but not the other. Ah, 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 ah. Voices 
branches singing out under a sunrise, gazing upon the clouds now white once, now gray. He stops pointing out the notes of a melody to watch a girl fall down onto the sea. He sings a lullaby to mesmerize her senses. He walks down onto the rocks to save this woman. He knows her, but at the same time he doesn't. She was the same, but altered. Why would such a woman kill herself for love until he realizes he is the reason she is near going under swimming with the creatures below? He jumps after her and cradles her body, walking back to the shore where no one would find her. He holds her and cries a thousand tears, but suddenly her eyes open up to see him in fear. He sings without noticing she is perfectly fine, but she does not speak, for her voice is not found. And then she claps and gaps, grabs, for he has no eyes. But how does such a gentle man, whose eyes are gone, find her still alive? She felt so wrong. How is she still alive? She starts to marvel. Her life had ended like glass and gravel. He stops to sing to hear her heartbeat, synchronizing with his heart. How bittersweet. A man who has no eyes but such a beautiful, sway voice saves a woman with rare, great eyes with no sound, no choice. He found her to part, but now she is flourishing. Love will never pay, fade, no matter what sadness appears before them. Love is bitter and a moist Baby, 
close your eyes. I know I look good. <laughs> but what do you see when you look at me? Are you showing me what people see? Like the beauty that clearly lays upon my face. Or the spots, wrinkles, and dirt that clog the pores of my inner being. When I look at me, I see the whole package. So why should I rely on what you tell me? Because sometimes you have been more of an enemy. So go ahead, close your eyes, and let me see the person that I am and that others enjoy being around. <laughs> I shrouded her with my holy arms. Passions what a buzz I laid my face upon her soft, tender skin that's placed between her beautiful stomach and her rosy neck. Fear is what a buzz I grasped even closer to her warm body to meet mine. Love is what we made as I plunged my ship inside her delta and my island completely connected to hers. Honestly, I never wanted it to end, but all good things do. After we completed our unholy deed, I vanished without a sound. We both knew why I left, but my perplexed and dishonored soul wouldn't let me stay. I know she cried, as did I. I know we both felt abandoned, for even I felt lost. I know she no longer lives. It deeply troubles my mortal soul. A little pain I feel as I mark my walls with another fall in love and remove from myself the one of her pleasure, making time and space for a new goddess. Exhale, passion, love, repeat. The torment never ends as long as pleasure is what they need. want to quickly acknowledge Anna Krauss. Um, I will speak with you in the reception, but we sure wanted to make everybody know that she was here and she did participate. And we've got another student who would like to read. I did the portrait of Miss Reed by Miss Reed. My poem is called, Is Black and Always Real? I thought I was daddy's girl. Maybe I was wrong. I thought that he loved me for me. Maybe I was wrong. I thought the time spent as his child would always mean something. I thought maybe one day he, would, he wouldn't leave. I thought maybe one day he would come back. I thought maybe one day things would go back to where they were before. I thought maybe, just maybe, I would be loved. I thought maybe I would be a child again. But maybe I was wrong. I thought, I thought, I thought, maybe thinking is something I shouldn't do. Reality is where it's at. I'm a child who has a dad, not a father. All right. <laughs> all right, yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Mother's nature's emotions across the river. Night sky, lights fly into the limits that we set for ourselves. A di drifting dream, sweet but starting to sway, daring to run away. The wind blows cold tendrils outside, but to the fire it lost. Snow decorated the trees and ground with this everlasting frost. Although the coldness was nipping at our skin, we could hardly feel it over the anxiety pulling in the pit of our stomach. Chills trailed down our spine, which kept us strong, causing us to whisk around. 
only to freeze the solid tracks carved by our feet in the ground, each breath becoming shallow. We breathe in the emotions of Mother Nature, isolated and cold. The smoke choking the neighboring town, leaving a gift of em embers yet screaming loud. Caught in the rocks, they scratch and burn. Yet it's quiet from my view across the flowing river. But we can feel the sorrow of the forest, as though it has a fever. It is not becoming wild, just being free. Even the snow that blankets the ground could never help us now. Maybe it's a movie or a dramatic scene, because it's something that cannot be real. No, this I don't believe. As Mother Nature helps us kill the tiny soldiers that constantly attack our careless bodies, we cause her pain and let her limbs burn away. Each day, we lay silently. All I can do is speculate, because right now, it just seems to be Mother Nature's fate. Yeah, that's right. Right there, that's our heart. Maybe one day we will learn to take her gift away. Even though it should chew at our souls and turn us atoms into filet mignon, we, she still graces us with the chilly winter and warms us with the blanket of snow. Flesh, supple and soft, pure moonlit eyes, innocent and divine that look through black stars as she slowly dies. A siren's call screaming out the world's plea, drawing men into the brink of misery, sinking in your claws, cutting in deep, drawing sweet blood, scraping fragile bone with black nails covered in sin and stone, foul, yellow, dripping with spit, licking her breast, pain induced twitch. At the zenith of time of vibrant young life, now flush, weak, tired, deprived, raped by the being of which she gave birth, sucking to the surface of a reserve of self-worth, polluting her fertile seas, turning them white with foam, every touch burning her skin, scars where beauty was supposed to grow. Blind to the barren world around them, idle hands carries every curve. Narrow eyes see only a sweet figure, a lame mind registers not, her cries revert. A shiver that sends buildings crashing down, a tear that drowns an entire town, leaving people shaking. Skin gone pale, flooded lungs, hearts that fail, fading to a fatal silence. Mm. A bitter peace so still, blood chills in one's body. Future's conception slowed and derailed. What have we done to her? It is not any one man or the other, it is her children coming together as a whole and raping our mother, taking her for all she's willing to give. Arms around her, she is man's world, but he takes her virgin will through many twists and turns. She is strong, but slowly breaking, beginning to show the wrath of her storms. She will not forever lie submissive beneath us, for a child can only go so far without scorn. Ignore me, abuse me, leave me for death. You create these monstrous monuments and put such great value on them, your roads, your bridges, and your plants. Yet I, your true creator, I, your giver, I, your true lover, you use me to be your own gods. You destroy me to create such hollow, hollow love, yet here I, here I stand giving you such great land and clean air. Still, you kill me with deathly charred. I shall return such love and kindness by making you what you really want to be, gods. 
I make you create while I'm giving you so easily, making you create the air that fills your lungs while you, your nurturing giver. I will watch you become the gods you so badly want and die in my winter gaze. All right. <laughs>
we had some collaboration going on during during the artistic versus workshop. So those young ladies here that are signed, two of them. Yeah, two of them are. Two of them are. And then my man back there at the back, he he can you can you can you get in the mix, uh, <laughs> can you get in the mix? Come on up, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna start with this because this is, you know, this poem is uh, kind of uh, somber. We're going to start somber and, and finish uh, on a lively note. But uh, one of the poems that I, that I uh, did, and one of the things we talked about was incorporating music into, into the poetry. And the young lady who, wow, <laughs> you did it. <laughs> that was perfect. And that song, was, it, was that an original song? Did you make up that song? Wow. So the song was original and the poem was original. And I thought it was like um, an Indian, <laughs> Native American chant or something. You know, that was phenomenal. So this poem uh, that, I, that I wrote is called um, Baptism. And, and I wrote the poem uh, based on an infrastructure event just like this. I got a picture of, a, of a, like a, an abandoned swimming pool. And you know, I couldn't figure it out. And it was just based on a fear that I had of losing my son. And I wrote the poem, and then I realized it was connected uh, to a song. Y'all know the song, right? taking baths, he would smile that same immaculate smile I remember seeing in his ultrasound pictures. <laughs> Clearly through her amniotic fluid, a face still forming, yet a perfect finished smile. Those were his first swimming lessons, and because of him, we learned to swim too. First at Virginia Beach, then in fall we joined the Y and took vacations always where there was an ocean, lake, or pond. Eventually, we put in a swimming pool with a diving board and dived head first into that lifestyle repeatedly. Submerged with him in that weightlessness, I felt more like his twin than his father. Then at 16, we came home and found him, not swimming, but floating, his body bloating on water he could not breathe. The air left my lungs like a vacuum, the only water I saw for months were tears. Now even rain on my forehead reminds me of that minister sprinkling holy water at his Christianity. I long to be with him again. I long to see him again. I am told that would require my baptism, but I am still afraid to wade the water. chapbook uh, titled uh, 21 Imaginary T-shirts. Uh, and so it's just all these different aphorisms. Uh, it's after uh, one of the National Poetry Books of the Year, I think it was 2010, Terrence, Terrence Howard. Uh, he's from a university out west. And he's got this great poem called 21 Imaginary T-shirts. And I thought I would follow after him 
and do my own. And so this one, you know, bees are the humanity. Bees are the uh, poets are the bees of humanity, uh, pollinating the growth of mankind. Uh, and so I actually wrote that into a poem that I'm going to do, the last poem I'm going to do today. Uh, but I'm also going to do a couple of different ones uh, for that, and then I'll get out of your way. You can enjoy something uh, else today. Uh, this, this poem is, is one that I wrote uh, for uh, my, my poetry team because I was trying to uh, help them understand uh, pace and meter and space uh, in, in poetry, uh, and uh, I figured the best way I could do that was to write a poem that illustrates uh, space uh, in poetry. Uh, and so, um, if I can remember the first line, <laughs> I talk, I talk, and then I get off track. I have to come back to it. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is uh, a poem uh, titled uh, The Encyclopedia of Old School Moves. Since this is March Madness, any ball players out there? Yeah. Ah, ball players. yeah. So I gotta watch the women's March Madness too, right? Who's who's gonna win? Who's they gonna win? You never know till it ends again. Yeah, right. <laughs> All the way to the end. Kentucky and the, the bluegrass battle last night was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, called the Encyclopedia of Old School Moves. New School thinks he's got game. Old School's jersey hangs in the Hall of Fame. New school shoots baby hooks in mirror, becomes infatuated with self, thinks this addiction helps him see clear. Old school shoots sky hooks, textbook isn't hooked, getting sky high. New school thinks he's got handles, says he can school old school even wearing sandals. Old school's the ultimate ball handler, both hands behind his back, ball like it's on a chain, like magic. No handcuffs. New school thinks he invented the crossover. Crosses over, then crosses back. Old school has it perfected. One simple move, boyhood to manhood without turning back. New school thinks he's got eyes in the back of his head. Doesn't see the bullet coming, winds up dead. Old school sees the trap coming, protects the ball, avoids the steal, and a life sentence. New school thinks he's got a jumper, throws up a prayer, shot gets blocked, claims he was fouled, thinks the ref wasn't fair. Old school rolls with the punches, follows his miss, fades on the second shot, swish. Now who's ticked? New school thinks he's got a multi-million dollar contract. He won't pass you the ball unless he can get it back. Old school sets the pick, team player, sensation, passes the ball. To the next generation. Uh, yeah, so, th and this poem, I always like to do this poem, I'm still doing this poem. I wrote this poem uh, for my daughter. I think she was like 14 when I wrote it, uh, and uh, she's uh, 21 now, uh, and uh, it's given me a beautiful grandchild and all that kind of stuff and uh, and so uh, I, I, I gave her this poem one morning I was taking her to the bus stop and I gave her this poem on a piece of paper and she said I like this daddy <laughs> and I didn't know she could write poems I, I didn't know she was writing poems until uh, I went to school I had to go to school I had to help her clean out her locker and I opened the locker and all these poems just like start cascading out of the locker onto the floor you know I was like, what's up with that, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so this poem's for her, it's called, You Are the Subject. Yeah. Sentence structure is elementary, an SOL, a required standard of learning for every little girl in school. 
And the subject-verb agreement is an imperative rule for every man who ever wishes to speak to you. Lest he be an illiterate fool who doesn't know the difference between the subject of a sentence or the object. Now this is not complex math or fractions. This is simple set of structure followed by concrete actions. And regardless of what language he be speaking, <laughs> your chapters let him know in no uncertain terms that especially since you be dressed properly, that you will be properly dressed. <laughs> so, when he begins this sentence with, yo, your immediate response to him should be, no. <laughs> and then watch his big baggy pants hit the ground. Or when he tries to get your attention with baby, your comeback to him should be, maybe, you don't really know, that's a pronoun. It may be like the way this sounds, but I am the subject of this sentence, not the object. So uh, this poem, uh, I, I wrote this poem out of uh, passion, definitely get sparked this, uh, because uh, I've been hearing uh, something in poetry, and you know, we, with this thing called poetry, and we live in this great country where freedom of speech is our right, uh, but of course with freedom of speech becomes, comes responsibility, and so uh, in Brave New Voices, uh, we, we try not to censor uh, the poets. They can say what they want to say. You should be brave enough to say whatever you want to say. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we say we're not going to censor, uh, and you can use profanity in context, uh, and some people uh, sometimes use that as a license to steal, you know. So, you know, it's, then it kind of grows. And, and then we become what we say we're not, which are, you know, misogynistic rappers and so forth. And uh, and so, you know, it's just been festering with me. And uh, and then uh, about a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, the spark that you know really uh, lit the the kindling uh, was this uh, young lady who he came to one of my readings, and and she, you know, she she did very well. Uh, and, and she, she went to the edge, but she didn't leap. <laughs> and then she came to the other reading, uh, and she re read this poem, and the last word of her poem was the B word. And it was like, boom! And the whole room blew up, right? And I was like, that's it. That's it. I'm writing a poem. And, uh, and so, um, this is the poem titled On Profanity. Would you rather have a duffel bag full of four letter hand grenades or a mind like a nuclear reactor? Mixing a million radioactive words in infinite combinations. Not just shocking ears of small populations, but stimulating minds in all the constellations. Poets are the bees of humanity, pollinating the growth of mankind. So untwist your tongue's taste buds and find the reason bees produce honey and not salt. The solution has nothing to do with fault. And this poem is not about blame or fame. We all leave this world the same way we came, and in between the difference we make shouldn't put our ancestors to shame. So I ask you again. Would you rather have a duffel bag full of four-letter hand grenades or a mind like a nuclear reactor? Because in the aftermath of a nuclear blast, you'd want to be the one in control, rather than cursing the masters who stole knowledge and made, no and made knowledge the new commodity bought and sold for souls. And I'll take this for a metaphorical question. It's historical in every context. Misinterpret the metaphorical content, and you could quickly find yourself lost. Exhaust your vocabulary, and it could cost you critical seconds trying to decide the meaning of a word on one hand, and on the other, the writer's intent. But let's just say you were sent a problem to solve. Somebody asked you to produce a word without a vowel. Here you go off in a tangent looking for something foul, like how to say the F word in French. Coach going to have you sitting on the poet's bench, 
spitting obscenities like you got a stammer, like you ain't finished grammar school. Think you're going to take on some serious poets, you're going to get hammered, fool. Poets don't get licensed to break the rules until they know the rules. If you're going to, if you're going to silence the critics, you got to master the meter. you got to, you got to validate the verse. you got to, you got to, uh, you got to polish the pun, perfect personification. You gotta know the etymology of poetology. <laughs> Look, I'm done. I could have written a haiku and in 17 syllables been done with you. But I'm gonna give you one more chance. Would you rather shine constant like the sun or be broken like a flashlight? Or would you rather have pearls on your tongue or a mouthful of ashes? Peace. <laughs>